Institutes of Higher Education and fellow colleagues here with us today. A very warm welcome to the 23rd Jobs and Skills 23rd job, uh, Jobs and Skills uh, Insight webinar on the state of skills driving the innovation workforce. I am Alicia, your moderator for today. Together with me is Corinne and Tim, and we are from the Skills Development Group at Skills Future Singapore. What we at SSG do is to provide all Singaporeans with the opportunities to develop their potential throughout their lives. We believe that the skills, passion and contributions of every individual Singaporean will drive Singapore's next phase of development towards an advanced economy and a more inclusive society. Regardless of which point you are at in your life, you can be sure to find a variety of resources to help you attain skills mastery and make informed decisions to expand your skill sets for professional and career development. Before we start, allow me to go through uh, some administrative details. This entire webinar will take about 50 minutes to an hour. During the webinar, attendees are muted by default to avoid electronic feedback and interference. However, you can post your questions anytime by using the Q&A button on your screen. If you see any questions by other attendees that you would also like answered, you can upvote these questions and we will do our best to address them. If we are unable to answer any questions during the, web, uh, the session, please be assured that we will address them after the webinar. Our presenters will be speaking for about 30 minutes, followed by about 15 minutes of Q&A. This webinar session will be recorded and published on my Skills Future portal, SSG's LinkedIn page and YouTube channel. The slides will be sent to all uh, attendees via email. We have two speakers from Coursera today. Firstly, we have Eric Carsten, a data scientist who works with external university and NGO researchers to extract valuable insights using Coursera's data. He also works with content strategy team to forecast skills trends and content demand using signals from the Coursera platform. Next, we have Chad Pasha, a senior advisor for government partnerships in Coursera. Chad has worked with heads of state, senior business leaders, and government authorities to strengthen institutions and companies' performance. His experience includes digital transformation and data science roles in the UK and global organizations. Without further ado, let us welcome Eric and Chad, who will share key findings from Coursera's Global Skills Index, such as the skills of, of tomorrow, regional skills insights, and ways to narrow the skills gap. Over to you, Chad and uh, Eric and Chad. Thank you very much. Um, I think I lost my screen sharing for a sec. Can, sorry, can, can someone tell me if you can see the slides? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm looking at slide two now. Oh, fantastic. All right, sorry. Thank you very much for the, the chance to speak with you today. My name is Eric Karsten. I'm a data scientist at Coursera, and I'm joined today by Chad Pasha on our government team. So I'd love to share some thoughts with you on the state of skills across countries and industries as well as some of the skills gaps that exist among university learners today. I'll also be discussing how Coursera's data gives us a unique perspective on these topics. And finally, Chad will discuss how Coursera thinks about helping institutions around the world meet some of these challenges. So our agenda will walk you through the Global Skills Index report that we first published in 2020. I'll first discuss the methodology of the report, then I'll walk you through some of the insights globally as well as a deep dive into the data we have on Singapore. After that, I will walk you through some of the key trends we saw when we took a closer look at campus skills data in the Unbounded University report. Finally, Chad will close out the talk with some case studies and an understanding of our partnership with Skills Future Singapore, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So I want to begin by giving an overview of Coursera as a platform. For those of you who may not be familiar, we have over 77 million registered learners, over 200 partners producing courses, specializations, and degrees across a wide range of content domains. And we have over 6,000 institutions from businesses to campuses to governments transforming talent using the co content on Coursera. This vast amount of data is what powers the insights you're going to see today. So Coursera's enterprise learning platform helps businesses achieve their goals with mastery learning from leading institutions, goals-based programs tied to future roles, and the ability to track the actual skills developed. 
The high impact we can deliver for businesses is why over 2,400 companies and 20% of the Fortune 500 have chosen Coursera. Fortune 500 companies, ministries of labor, and world famous universities have hired Coursera to solve their skill related challenges from digital transformation to workforce development to student engagement. And being prepared for digital transformation, for example, necessitates all kinds of skills. And that's exactly the data we're going to be diving into deeper today uh, and understanding from the, the wide range of sources we have on the Coursera platform. The core skills we will focus on are business, technology, and data science skills. Skills in these categories are of course always changing at a rapid pace, but they form the backbone of the fourth industrial revolution. And that's what makes them such breakouts in our vast catalog of over 4,000 courses. In fact, it's precisely because these, chills, these skills are changing so rapidly that so many learners are finding themselves continually needing to reskill in them. So now that you have a sense of some of the data we have on the Coursera platform, let's dive into the Global Skills Report motivation and methodology. The motivation for this report is that the world is undergoing massive and rapid change. We believe we can leverage Coursera's unique data to understand how the skills landscape is evolving. The World Economic Forum forecasts that 42% of jobs that exist today are going to have an entirely different skill set by 2022, in just one year. And skills themselves don't last that long anymore, with a technical skills expiring once every two years, according to a Deloitte report. In a world full of constant disruption, continued investment in the right areas is essential to remaining competitive and ensuring that workforces and individuals are equipped with the right skills at the right time. Moreover, the digital divide is widening. The jobs most at risk of automation are those requiring little background knowledge in digital skills. Government and society more broadly has a responsibility to address it by creating greater access to educational and economic opportunity. And we believe that knowledge, digital skills, and credentials are precisely the differentiator needed to help the most vulnerable workers reskill into careers of the future. And the pandemic has only made the digital divide worse. 84% of employers report that the pandemic has increased their intent to rapidly digitize work processes, according to survey results in the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report this past October. Not only that, but studies have found that the jobs most at risk of automation are also those which are most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not all doom and gloom, however. There are lots of jobs with increasing skills demand. Microsoft is projecting 145 new million jobs globally in primarily digital roles by 2025. So while the dual disruption of automation and COVID will hurt many sectors, it will also bring about millions of digital jobs that can easily be reskilled into. And it's the opportunity that individuals have to make these transitions through learning programs like those on Coursera. So with the challenge of digital disruption in mind and the disruption due to COVID, we wanted to use Coursera's unique skills benchmarking data to shed light on where the proficiency gaps are and what the trending digital skills of the future are. To do this, we build our global skills index and we rely on the Coursera skills graph. The skills graph is a series of machine learning models that continuously take in data from instructors, universities, individual learners, companies, and governments to add new skills and calibrate to external standards over time. It is able to capture major changes in the skills landscape to always provide an up-to-date picture of the economy. With the skills graph, we have a skills taxonomy that combines open source taxonomies like Wikipedia and curation from subject matter experts. In addition, our taxonomy integrates with taxonomies created by the World Economic Forum and many companies who use their own internal taxonomy. This taxonomy captures both broad skills at the domain or subject level, as well as the very granular specific tools and technologies that roll up into this broader category of skills. So it is comprehensive in the set of skills it encompasses across business technology and data science. More specifically, the Global Skills Index draws on four pieces of the skills graph to create our country, industry, and field of study rankings, as well as to understand trending skills and top roles. 
First, we use the skills graph to map 1,800 courses and 15,000 assessments to over 4,000 skills in business technology and data science. To do this, we leverage machine learning models that draw upon natural language processing and feedback from instructors and learners to understand what skill is taught by which course or assessment. Once we know the relevant set of assessments for each skill, we measure country, industry, and field of study skill proficiencies using a variant of the Glico algorithm used for chess ranking. This is based on actual learner performance data and assessments that range from multiple choice quizzes to peer reviewed projects to programming assignments. To isolate the trending skills for 2020, we combine several sources of data like platform search volume and enrollments into a single trends index that computes skill popularity and allows us to identify both the currently trending and the growing skills that will be the trending skills of tomorrow. To identify the key roles and fields of study per skill, we look at those who enroll in a skill most often compared with the site-wide average. All of that data from our platform is combined with analysis of external data sources resulting in our Global Skills Index report. While today's insights are from the 2020 Global Skills Index, we will be releasing the 2020 run report in a few short weeks on June 9th. So if you're interested in that, simply download last year's report and you'll be able, uh, you'll be automatically emailed the new one when it is released. There's a QR code here to do it. I think we're going to show the QR code again at the end of the talk. So no, no anxiety there. I'm really excited about some of the work we've done this year to understand entry level skill pathways in the new 2021 report. But I can't say anything too specific until the findings are released. So now let's walk through some of the findings of the 2020 report, starting at a global level and narrowing down to specifically focus on the skills trends in Singapore. Before I go telling you about country rankings, I want to convince you a little bit that skills proficiency is a measure that you should care about and one that correlates with other measures of country success that you might be familiar with. For economic equality, skills are essential to high quality and sustainable employment. We see a strong positive relationship between average skills proficiency and labor force participation rate at the country level. Countries with higher skills proficiency also see higher labor force participation rates and more individuals active in the labor force. As digital disruption increasingly changes the nature of work, it will select for certain skills over others, making some job tasks obsolete and making careers require an ever-changing set of skills. We all need to work together to ensure that workers have access to the right upskilling opportunities that allow them to stay relevant and stay participating in the labor market. Additionally, with labor markets upended amid COVID-19 and technology putting large populations at risk of losing their jobs, countries should consider the impact of their skills landscape on income inequality as well. Our data reveals a negative correlation between a country's average skill proficiency across business technology and data science domains and the share of income held by the top 10% of that country. So now that we see what skills proficiency is capturing at the country level, Let's look at skills proficiency around the world. Here is the heat map of business domain rankings across our four performance categories of cutting edge, competitive, emerging, and lagging. Darker colors in this map indicate stronger company, country performance and placement in the top categories of rankings, while lighter colors on this map indicate relatively weaker country performance and placement in the lower categories. Looking at the global data in business, we find first that Europe as a region stands out in business. In the Global Skills Index rankings, four out of the top five countries in business skills are European. Second, the UAE is the lone non-European country in the top of the business rankings and comes in fifth place with cutting edge skills in management, marketing, and sales. Third, the Asia Pacific region shows a mixed and unequal performance in business. Developed countries like Singapore, New Zealand, and Australia show much, much stronger skills proficiency than developing countries in the region. Turning to technology, skills in this domain are focused on the creation, maintenance, and scaling of software. And this includes skills like computer networking, security engineering, and software engineering. 
three highlights are that first, again, Europe as a region dominates the technology rankings and Russia outperforms all other countries in technology with a strong education system that promotes early access to computer science courses to back up its rating. Second, Latin America has promise in technology with Brazil placing six in our software engineering rankings, showing the region's potential, although most of those countries currently lag behind. Third, Canada places 20th in the overall technology rankings and is the strongest performer in North America, way ahead of the United States, which comes in 37th. This may seem strange that we call the United States emerging in technology when it is home to hubs like Silicon Valley, but I would challenge you to remember that we are benchmarking the typical learner in the country on Coursera, and that the United States may not have an equal distribution of skills within its population. And here's finally the global skills map for data science rankings. Skills in this domain focus on capturing and utilizing the data generated within a business for either decision making or for powering underlying data products and services. This includes skills like data visualization, machine learning, and statistics. Three highlights we find are first, that Israel is a global leader and a regional powerhouse in data science skills, reflecting a strong education system and booming technology industry. Second, China is relatively stronger in data science and AI skills than India, reflecting a recent investment it has made to become a global AI leader and an interesting consideration for other countries in the region. Finally, within Latin America, Argentina leads the region in data science. And overall, Latin America has a burgeoning tech ecosystem that showcases strong performance in data science skills compared with other emerging countries in the Asia Pacific region, the Middle East and Africa. So with those global insights in mind, we're gonna begin our process of narrowing in. So let's dive into the Asia Pacific region and look deeper at the skills trends before focusing in on Singapore. This region is the world's largest global economy and one of the most stratified regions in terms of skills proficiency. While we have developing countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh lagging behind, while economies like India, Malaysia, and Indonesia are emerging and rising quickly, countries like Singapore, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia are at the top of the pack. However, it's worth keeping in mind that skills proficiency is a moving target and skills are changing faster than ever. So some of these rankings will move around a little bit in the upcoming 2021 report. This means that individuals, companies, and countries that want to stay on top need to keep investing in education lest they be outpaced. Turning to Singapore specifically, we have over 600,000 registered learners on Coursera. And while Singapore is cutting edge in many skills in business and data science, we see in our benchmarking data room for improvement in some software engineering skills relative to others in the region. So now let's take a deeper look at the trending skills specifically in Singapore. Coursera's skills graph allows us to abstract away from individual course titles and look at the trending skills across all enrollments. This means if two courses teach Python, we don't say Python is less popular because the enrollments are spread across more courses. Instead, we combine the demand for Python across all the courses teaching it. We see that in Singapore, a lot of the trending skills are in digital transformation technologies across business, technology, and data science. In data science, learners are picking up new programming languages like Python and new techniques ranging from machine learning for prediction to econometrics for causal analysis of data. In business, learners are picking up traditional skills like finance and marketing, as well as augmenting competencies in spreadsheet software and data analysis with the business intelligence tools needed to deal with big data. Finally, in technology, we see that programming principles and theoretical computer science remain on top. And this can be a sign of a more mature technology industry that is thinking about high level technology strategy and less about the weeds of day-to-day -day implementation. Now, let's turn our attention to the growing skills. This uses the same methodology as the trending skills, but allows us to preview what's next. This is suggestive of some of the trends on the horizon in Singapore. Beginning with data science, we see the rise of the intersection between data science and computer programming with C programming and Python topping the list. Additionally, we see increased interest in Bayesian inference, analysis of map data, GIS, 
and machine learning toolkits like Keras. This is suggestive of some of the ways data science is maturing. Keras democratizes deep learning to those with less expertise can do it. Those with more expertise are becoming more interested in Bayesian models and new forms of data like GIS map data. Moving on to business, we see growing interest in content marketing, a relatively new skill tied to the growth of digital platforms and the trend of businesses distributing their own thought leadership to market content. The most interesting skill on the business list to me is actually the med uh, medical billing. This is suggestive of the growing size and complexity of the medical industry and possibly has something to do with the pandemic. So we'll have to see if it's still a growing skill in the coming years. Finally, moving on to technology, we see growing demand for testing. Continuous integration and deployment is not a new concept, but it has become increasingly important to implement automated tests to improve code reliability. Additionally, we see skills like virtual reality, VR, appearing here as cutting edge technologies and emerging software engineers are figuring out how to use them. Finally, linear algebra skills may surprise you, but these actually come with machine learning quite often. As data scientists are implementing models in high level languages, machine learning and software engineers also have to gain an understanding of these algorithms to deploy them at scale. So this trending skill may be a manifestation of the growth of machine learning in production on the technology side of things, rather than just in development on the data science side of things. Now, I'd like to pivot a little bit towards the career skills gap and what universities and employers can do to narrow it. So to define some terms, the skills gap is simply that there are learners seeking new jobs and they, have, they find employers hiring for those roles uh, require skills that the learners don't have, like basic Python programming as an example. So as we go through this section, I'm gonna build to the following two solutions to address the gap between the skills people have and the skills employers expect. The first is blended learning where universities specialize in their strengths and borrow courses to plug curriculum holes. The second is lifelong learning, where universities and companies offer courses to individuals long before, long beyond their college years, and individuals engage in practices of continuous reskilling throughout their life as technologies change. So before we look at the role of institutions in narrowing the skills gap, I think it's important to look at the actions that individuals are taking on their own. There has traditionally been a trend that female learners make up a smaller portion of enrollments than male learners on Coursera, especially in STEM subjects. This has the potential to leave women unprepared for jobs of the future at the same time as they have dis been disproportionately saddled with the additional childcare burdens stemming from pandemic school closures. Our expectation was that we'd see women disproportionately enrolling in fewer courses, but we actually see the opposite. Let's consider this learner. She's a single mother of three children who is laid off in July due to COVID. And after being home for almost a year with children who are distant learning, made a determination to advance her education and the career and, uh, and the future of her children. And so we see this learner enrolling in heavily job relevant content skills like contact tracing in the immediate term and user experience research in the longer term. But this trend isn't isolated to one learner. Zooming out into Coursera's data, we've seen remarkable resilience in the face of the pandemic. The main line graph shows the proportion of enrollments made by female learners over time. The different colors show different groups of users enrolling in STEM or non-STEM courses. But the key takeaway is that for the years 2018 and 2019, we we're in a relatively steady state of a low proportion of enrollments being made by female learners. And then in Q1 of 2020, COVID shocks this system and across all types of content, both emerging and developed markets, female learners make up a larger share of the total enrollments made on Coursera, not just a larger raw number. Survey data from the World Economic Forum shows that businesses are accelerating digital transformation amidst the pandemic, as we discussed earlier in this talk. And women are responding by stepping up. They're using courses on Coursera to plug gaps in their knowledge and prepare themselves for new careers. Not only are these learners closing a gender gap on Coursera, but they're closing a career skills gap we talked about a couple slides ago. Now let's turn our attention from women to unemployed learners. This is a learner in the Workforce Recovery Program 
who was laid off from their office job. After eight years away from teaching, they decided to renew their license and get back in the classroom with courses on Coursera. So again, let's return to the aggregate data and see what it tells us about unemployed learners overall. So before we analyze this figure, let's understand what's going on here. Coursera has some pretty cool algorithms that I talked about in the skills graph section that look at all of the assessments and lecture material in each course on the platform to determine which skills are being taught in that course. Using this data set, we're able to determine which skills are trending across the millions of enrollments on the platform by abstracting our analysis away from course titles. So the tables on this slide compare the trending skills between employed learners on the left and unemployed learners on the right. Within each table, we compare the trending skills in 2019 to the trending skills in 2020. The first interesting trend that emerges is that there is a hierarchy of needs. At the bottom is the need for employment. As you can see in the left table, unemployed learners on Coursera are doubling down on job relevant skills from technical skills in data science to soft skills like writing and strategy. This trend remains consistent from the year 2019 to the year 2020. These learners want to make a career pivot, and as part of it, they're turning to companies and universities to fill gaps in their skills. For learners on the job, we see the next level in the hierarchy of needs. The table on the right shows that there is a surge of demand from 2019 to 2020 for personal development courses focused on dealing with the stress of the pandemic. Skills like mindfulness and listening are pushing out technical skills like deep learning that were top skills for unemployed for employed learners in 2019. This trend shows not just the stress of the pandemic, but that having a job provides learners with the luxury of stability to be able to take care of their mental health. So where do we go from here? We've seen a lot of mid-career job seekers have their plans interrupted by the pandemic and turn to courses on Coursera for job relevant and personal development skills. But you may be wondering, What's happening to college students at this time? Well, let's get the college perspective from a learner on Coursera in the Coursera for Campus initiative, which provided free Coursera access to millions of college learners during the height of the COVID pandemic in 2020. This learner says they joined an internship and was given a project of an advanced level where they didn't have the knowledge and portfolio management. So they browsed Coursera and found a basic course that taught them portfolio management. And this gave them the confidence they needed to finish their internship project on time. So college students should be prepared to take on entry level jobs and internships. So we wanted to look into our data, our skills benchmarking data, to understand if they are. In the Unbounded University report, we measured the skills proficiency of thousands of students across different majors in the skills we can benchmark on Coursera. So each bar in this chart is one skill. And the overall set of bars represents the skills proficiency profile of students in engineering majors. The dark purple bars represent the current skills of college students in engineering majors, but the full report has data on all, all different number of majors. And we surveyed those students about their intended careers. Then we went out and we measured the skills proficiency of working professionals in students intended careers by major to see where the skills gaps were between the students and the working professionals. The blue dotted lines represent the gap between where university students are and where working professionals are in terms of skills proficiency. Some modest gaps should be expected, but we found some remarkable and surprising gaps in many majors. So let's consider the chart here, which is for the engineering major. We see large skills gaps in business and pro programming skills. So without getting too into the weeds, this suggests that engineering programs are often not teaching business and programming skills, but they're required on the job. So we wanted to test this hypothesis. Within each major, we looked at thousands of course catalogs from institutions around the world and identified the skills being taught in those courses. When we looked at what skills students were enrolling in on Coursera, we found some really interesting trends. The purple bars are enrollments and skills offered in fewer than 25% of course catalogs. The orange bars our enrollments and skills offered in more than 25% of course catalogs. We see that for all majors, the purple bars are larger than the orange bars. That is, we found that students are enrolling disproportionately in courses that are not taught on their campuses. In short, online learning can be a complement to an on-campus experience and not necessarily a substitute. 
For example, an engineering program, since we're on that subject from the last slide, may not offer business classes, but well-rounded and successful engineers may apply business skills like planning or budgeting in their day-to-day -day work. There is a natural opportunity to address some of these challenges with blended learning, where engineering schools specialize in core engineering skills while allowing students to round out their education with courses from other universities. So throughout this chunk of the talk, we've seen key trends emerge for two groups. First, we saw learners 25 and older are finding themselves in need of skills to make career pivots. And second, university students may be coming out of their programs unprepared for the workforce. Skills are changing faster and faster. Geometry has been essentially unchanged for hundreds of years, but IT skills have a median half-life of seven years, as we found in the report. So one of the questions we're posing for discussion for you to think about is if learners at all stages of their careers are finding themselves unprepared to be successful, what should universities and companies do to respond? And what can individuals do as themselves to prepare themselves? So to provoke some thoughts and hopefully some interesting discussions in the comment section of this webinar, I'd propose two opportunities for educational institutions and companies. The first one is around lifelong learning. Education shouldn't be one and done. Skills will change. So universities need to prepare students to learn how to learn, and companies need to offer mid-career reskilling opportunities or accept candidates from non-traditional backgrounds. The second is around blended learning. It is offering courses taught by other in, uh, institutions as part of an on-campus programming. And so with those thoughts, I'm gonna turn it over to Chad, who's going to focus a little bit more on the government and workforce development side of things, as well as the partnership with Skills Future Singapore. Great, thank you very much, Eric. I'm gonna share my screen now. Great, can you see my screen? Brilliant. So thank you very much for that uh, insightful context, uh, Eric. And building off of that, I'd like to actually talk about specific examples of where we leverage our data, um, national skills priorities in our uh, workforce development programs. So at the moment, we serve over 110 countries uh, globally all over the world where we drive workforce development, we build job ecosystems and all linked to critical skills development. These programs are highly customized to the national skills priorities. It leverages our global skills index data and aligns with the demands of the job market. And I noticed a question in the chat actually about this. So we very much engage with the private sector and the national and global job markets to gain those insights into the key skills needed for those economies uh, where we work with these countries. We design training programs across multiple domains. We help learners with things like job readiness, where we can train and prepare them with language, communication, self-management, build essential skills to be job ready. We focus a lot on displaced worker training as well, where we provide collections designed to help a worker train for an entry-level role into a field of high demand. We work to train entrepreneurs as well as aspiring entrepreneurs with critical skills to develop their businesses. We develop courses aligned to common core subjects for secondary school, uh, seniors, even community college students. We provide macro digital literacy training as well for population-wide proficiency in emerging technology, technologies, data, and digital transformation. And we often also work with job self, search self-care. So uh, promoting resilience for people who are out of work to prepare them for the long haul in terms of seeking the right jobs, preparing for interviews, and maintaining their mental well-being uh, in that process. With Singapore, we've had a number of ongoing uh, long-term partnerships with Singapore Civil Service College, which trains government officials across Singaporean ministries, with the Skills Future Program, which trains uh, Singaporean citizens on a number of key critical skills needed for the local economy. And we recently, in 2020, launched a program with the Employment and Employability Institute, E2I, to train unemployed Singaporeans seeking new skills to boost their career. Singapore is now Coursera's most in-demand customer base on a per capita basis, which basically means out of all the countries in the world, Singapore has the most learners in the country registered on Coursera per capita across the country. Um, we look forward to continuing our work across these different areas with Singapore. 
We also work very closely with Philippines as another example. Uh, our partner here is the Philippines Department of Science and Technology, which is mandated to upskill and reskill the nation for the fourth industrial revolution and to improve the national labor force's competitiveness, as well as attract FDI. In a recent program with the Department of Science and Technology, we had 75,000 learners enrolled, completing 2.4 enrollments, over 1.4 million learning hours, uh, which is a fantastically successful program, leveraging social media actually to engage with the learners and build online communities of learning across the country. We also work very closely, as I mentioned, with the private sector. So in Costa Rica, we engage with the leading companies in light manufacturing, life sciences, agribusiness, advanced manufacturing, and professional services to align with the skills that they need most in that economy, not only to attract foreign direct investment, but to help companies in the country expand their labor force. We have found it, it is very challenging workforce development. There are a number of areas where Coursera supports our partner agencies and ministries. One is on citizen data. We often encounter outdated records or inaccurate skills records of learners. So we leverage our data from the Global Skills Index. We leverage the data that we see as of the learners coming on board the platform to really give fresh insights into where the skills stack up for that country or that ministry or partner agency. We've also found that administration localization is really critical. Often government agencies don't have resources to run large scale programs. So we very much support them in tandem as, as uh, full partners to be able to engage with their learners in a simple low cost platform. Um, we even work with them for blended learning programs where they can invite apprentices and interns after they've done Coursera training online to face-to-face -face trainings. The important key bit is for that is for our partners to develop metrics for success. Metrics range very widely with our program partners. They include things like skills developed, jobs obtained, percent salary increase. Even some countries look at the confidence level of learners as they come in the program and graduate. So we're very much looking forward to continue our working with, with Singapore and for your questions in the Q&A after this. Many thanks. Kalisha? Okay. Uh, thank you, Eric and Chad, for the great sharing on the insights uh, from Coursera's Global Skill Index and the case studies. Uh, we will now take questions from the audience. Uh, okay, I see a few in uh, the chat and also like uh, under the Q&A uh, um, uh, tab. Okay, so maybe we, let's start with uh, Sunju's question. Um, how does Coursera review the relevance of courses in meeting emerging skills needs of uh, the learners? Shall, shall I take that one, Eric? Yeah, that... why, don't you, why don't you take that one? Yeah. So essentially, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the slides, it's a combination of factors. One is we look at the global skills index that we have often as a starting point to see where the skills gaps are in a particular country. We work very closely with our partners to understand where they'd like to benchmark the skills uh, of that country. What areas are they targeting to improve uh, in those gaps? And leveraging our relationships with the private sector as well as our partners' relationship with the private sector to see what are the key skills in demand in that country. And then that's how essentially some of the factors into how we build our learning programs. Okay, thank you, Chad, for that. Um, okay, under the Q&A session, okay, I see a question from Wenshan. Um, there are four upvotes. Uh, can you share more on the methodology you took in measuring skills gaps? I think this is something very interesting uh, to skills future Singapore as well. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd be glad to. So in this case, we were measuring skills gaps specifically of university learners relative to their intended careers. And so I'll go one layer deeper than I did when I was going through the slide because I realized I was going kind of quickly. Um, so what we do is we, we first uh, look at what major a learner is in. They specify this in their user profile. And we aggregate together all of the currently active university learners uh, in a particular major, and we look at their skills proficiency. And so how do we compute the average skills proficiency of those campus learners? Well, what we do is we have to take a step back to understand our skills scoring algorithm. So the, the thing that happens with a skills scoring algorithm, I mentioned it's a little bit like a chess match. So what happens is, is a learner comes up against an assessment, and each time a learner comes up against an assessment, we consider that a match. And what happens is, is our, learn, our, our algorithm for skill scoring sort of learns as the learners go through these different matches and evolve their skill scores. So 
if you um, come up to an assessment and you have a very high score and the assessment's very easy and you, you pass the assessment, your score won't go up very much because you were very proficient in the skill and the assessment was really easy. If you're really proficient in the skill and you come up to a really hard assessment and you pass it, your skill score goes up a lot. And so as we have learners progressing through these assessments, we get really precise calibrations of how difficult the assessment is and at the same time, how proficient the learner is in a particular skill. And so from that, we have this data set where for every learner in over 100 different skills across business technology and data science, we know the, the, the learner's proficiency in that skill. And so those skills range from things like Python programming to accounting to marketing um, to, to programming in C to data visualization. We can benchmark a lot of different things. And so from all of that, we get this, this proficiency profile across all of the skills we benchmark. And so to roll it up from the learner level to the college major level, what we do is we look at, okay, here are all the people majoring in mathematics. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna take uh, an average of those, those learners and say that's the typical learner majoring in mathematics. But we do something a little more clever than just taking an average. We actually weight it by our confidence in the learner skill score. So when a learner starts out, we're not very confident in their skill score. It moves a lot as they take the first few assessments and we learn about their proficiency. And so we have this second parameter we carry around with the learner skill scores, which is our confidence in the skill score. So it starts out wide and over time, as we hone in on their current proficiency, it gets narrower and narrower. So when we aggregate up to the college major level to understand skills proficiency of, of university students, we, we take this average weighted by our confidence. And so that allows us to put a lot more weight on, um, on learners who've been on the platform for a long time, who've taken some assessments for whom we really understand their scores. Additionally, um, so we do that for the university learners, and then we survey the university learners. What jobs do you want? We take you know, the top 10 jobs per major to try to understand, okay, these are sort of some of the intended jobs. And then we go out into the population of working learners on Coursera, and we do the same thing where we take this weighted average of skill scores, and that's how we go about identifying those, those skill gaps. So I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, feel free to ask further clarification. Okay. Thank you for that, Eric. Um, we have a question from Vivian. Um, Coursera has identified different user groups and their needs. So uh, how does Coursera help them overcome each group's uh, specific barriers to learning? Uh, any trends in attrition rate across the, the various types of courses? Yeah, I'd be, uh, Chad, I'd be happy to take this one. If, yeah. Um, so this is a, a definitely a difficult problem for us. And so I want to kind of give some context before we, we jump to two, two quick conclusions. So I think the first thing is many learners on Coursera are, um, coming from really difficult backgrounds. Maybe they're working a full-time job while also taking a course. Um, maybe they're a parent, um, all kinds of things. And so we can't just assess quality on pure completion rates. And this is one dimension in this multi-dimensional puzzle. And so obviously we see you know, things like lower completion rates in, um, uh, among learners who, you know, who have more challenging backgrounds. And, uh, and we see higher completion rates among learners who are you know, part of an enterprise program with dedicated time, or really highly motivated learners who may apply for financial aid or who may um, uh, pay for a course on their own with their own money and sort of commit to uh, completing it. So there's a range of completion rates at the user level. Um, and, and, and that's you know, something we, we keep in mind as we're designing courses and we're targeting interventions. But I think one of the things that's really cool and that makes me really excited about working at Coursera is the work we do on the data science team to design personalized learning interventions to keep people on track in their courses and help them achieve their goals. So for example, in the last year, we've rolled out um, a variety of features, both on the learner side and the instructor side to improve some of these attrition rates and ensure that learners, even from challenging backgrounds are able to complete the courses they want to. So these include things like automated nudges that help keep learners on track, you know, behavioral interventions, that allow learners to set a timeline, and then we automatically port that timeline into their calendar to help them remember what the assignments were and what they wanted to, to make progress on. And um, additionally, we work on it on the instructor side. So we provide instructors with insights about their courses so they can see which assignments are causing, uh, causing attrition or, or causing challenges in their courses, and they can revise those assessments 
and make sure that the course is a really productive, high quality learning experience. Uh, so we try to work on it from both ends, both from the learner side and, and the content side. And if I could just add to that very briefly as well, when we engage with our partners and structure, let, we call them enterprise programs together with our age partner agencies, we look very closely at the beneficiary's level of skill, uh, background, uh, education levels, and we actually curate collections really tailored to the needs of, that those learners have. And then once we launch the program, we engage with them continuously with our customer success team to ensure that they can progress uh, through the courses that we've actually set out for them and the pathways uh, to successful outcomes and completion. Thank you, Eric and Chad. Um, okay, uh, we have another question from Ed Tan. Uh, when comparing skills progress uh, and the focus areas uh, across uh, countries, how does Coursera account for differing uh, national focus, you know, which may contribute to some of these disparities? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this one is a, a pretty straightforward one which is while our methodology is designed to be sort of fairly robust and to weight the scores in which we have confidence, we actually don't try to do a lot of these corrections. We want the data to represent the typical learner on Coursera and you know, it has to be interpreted in the context of the region. So it's not always surprising, you know, the, the, the country rankings don't exclusively mean you know, this country is, is, is absolutely the cutting edge, this country is absolutely behind. It's more a representation of the, the typical learner in that country uh, who's on Coursera. And so we try to use this data to extract interesting insights and to help guide decision making in the country. But it shouldn't necessarily be the objective of every country to be on top of every ranking, more to get an understanding of what are their goals and what does their workforce look like and, and how is it competitive and, and, and what should their, their focus be uh, as they're looking whether at workforce development or uh, at attracting businesses or, or any other objectives they may have. Right. Um, okay, I, we have a, a question from Stalisha Sim. Uh, I think this is uh, regarding uh, some of the content you shared earlier. Uh, does Coursera have targeted programs uh, which focus on unemployed women to enable them to close their skills gaps prior to re-entering the workforce? I can probably take that one. A absolutely, we do. Um, we have in the in our work with those over 110 countries I mentioned earlier, many of them have a focus actually on women, uh, either girls in secondary school progressing on, women who've left career paths or uh, haven't finished university, or women graduating from university going into the market, or women who've been in the labor force, but we're not quite sure what skills they've acquired over time because it's been maybe patchy um, since they had their academic credentials. So a lot of our focus in those countries is very much on supporting women. Um, throughout the world, absolutely. I should also mention we have a program with Goldman Sachs called 10,000 Women, which is for women entrepreneurs specifically, that help women entrepreneurs grow their businesses and expand globally. It's a very sort of particular and successful program that we have. Okay, that's great. Um, we have a question, uh, next question from uh, Su Chin. Uh, you map skills against causes, but the skills are very applied. Um, wouldn't performance be a more uh, important, um, um, maybe a factor? So I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent clear on this question. It, it, can anyone on the, the panel um, clarify a, a little bit? Mm. So, I, you know, I, I think when we're, the, the idea is maybe, maybe one thing, this, this could be a, so I'm going to, I'm going to make an interpretation of this. If it's not the right answer to the, the question, please just ask the question again. Um, so uh, I think, I think maybe one of the things you're getting at is in the trending skills, we look at what skills are sort of disproportionately being in, in, enrolled in. And that's a very different question than uh, what skills are sort of at different proficiency levels. And so I think we sort of, we try to look at both the performance side of it in the skills benchmarking, as well as the, um, as well as the, the interest and the, the enrollment side of it in the trending skills to try to capture both sides of things. You know, the benchmarking is really exciting because um, it gets at that proficiency component um, and, and understanding whether you can actually do the skill. 
Um, but we can only do that for 100 or so skills. Well, there are thousands of skills that we can tag to content and understand what's trending and what's disproportionately being enrolled in. And so we try to look at both sides of the coin and, and put together a, a more comprehensive story there. May not be the question you asked, but that's 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 how we're we're approaching that. Okay. So uh, actually, I gave you some thought, and possibly it could uh, she could be referring to uh, skills utilization as opposed to um um uh like performance, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, we have uh the next question from Stefan Go. Uh, as more mature workers are acquiring digital knowledge through certified uh courses, um, employers are looking for skills, you know, which uh, which is uh, defined as knowledge and experience. How does Coursera bridge that this uh, knowledge get learned from experience to uh, complete this skills gap? Yeah, so I think I'll give some of an answer and I bet Chad's gonna wanna jump in and give another part of this answer because this is something we, we really like to think about a lot. Um, and so I'll give a couple, a couple of examples. I think the first one we try to do is we try to bring sort of learning experiences, especially in technical skills that are knowledge and experience. So whether that's through guided projects where you're following along with somebody um, or Coursera labs, where you actually have to implement the, the code yourself, uh, this gives a real opportunity for people uh, who are looking to reskill to build up a portfolio to show, I don't just have the certificate that says I know this, I also have a portfolio of examples where I've done it, and I know I can apply my skills. And so we're really excited when we see learners going beyond the coursework and making cool things with the new tools they've learned um, or, or building a digital uh, user experience design portfolio. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's some proven success we have in particular with our gateway programs. So things like our IT support certificate, our Google user experience design certificate, where those programs really take someone who doesn't necessarily have the full background, give them the knowledge, give them the hands-on practice, and then connect them to a hiring consortium that really accepts that credential and says, yes, we believe somebody who's been in this six month program, who doesn't necessarily have applicable background is a valid candidate for this job and is going to be prepared to be successful in an entry level career. Yeah, that's absolutely you know, spot on. Eric. Yeah. Um, and just to add a little bit to that, we also look at a lot of human skills, the soft skills that are really essential to job functions, things like leadership, people management, teamwork, collaboration, and communications as well. And many more experienced learners actually have really strong skills uh, in the human skills domain. So really getting them to practice that, hone that in, and combine that with actual technical skills uh, really is critical. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, I'm mindful of the time, so uh, probably we'll answer like uh, maybe one last question. Um, okay, uh, well, we have, we have one from um, SYF. Um, you share that you study the individual skills through assessment to identify the skills gaps. Uh, but at the country level, uh, how can we effectively and quickly determine uh, the current skills of the workforce and also to identify the skills gaps and enhance, uh, enhance the skills uh, shortages? Yeah, so I think um, we talked about this a little bit, um, kind of when, when we talked about the skills gap, but we do this work where we, while we benchmark at the individual level, we then roll those things up to the national level, to the, the university major level, to the, the industry level. And it's at that, that roll-up level where we, we try to identify sort of some of these gaps in a population. I think the other thing that's really uh, interesting for, uh, in particular, we've seen this with companies and also with governments who have large learning programs on our, our platform, is they're using the skills benchmarking at the individual level, uh, not on the side of identifying shortages, but uh, identifying untapped talent. So who knew that you had so many people um, you know, in your call center with great data analysis skills. You know, maybe some of them are, are ripe to reskill within your company or are, are ripe if you're a government to recommend to, to hiring partners. And so the, the benchmarking, while it does work at the individual level, it can still work to address kind of understanding these skills gaps and operationalizing changes um, at, at, at the national level. I think also um, our quality of data is gonna depend on how many people in a country we sample. So a huge portion of Singapore's population has taken at least a course on Coursera. So we have actually pretty good penetration into understanding, you know, what's the typical learner look like in Singapore? 
This isn't true of many countries and it depends on access um, across different countries, but the, the, the more data we have, the richer the insights we can give and sort of the richer we can slice and dice the data to understand, okay, what are high education workers doing? What are low education workers doing? How's the difference between men and women? Um, we're doing some really exciting work to identify uh, gender skill gaps right now that hasn't quite been published. And so that's some of what we can do with, with the data we have. But I, I think there's a fundamental point in the question, which is it's not perfect. We don't know the skill of every single worker in every single country. And so we do the best we can with the, the data we have. So thank you for that, Eric and Chad. Okay. Um, I think uh, we are mindful of the time. Um, so uh, for the questions that we are unable to answer, uh, we will uh, address them uh, after the webinar. So um, thank you everyone. Uh, we have come to the end of this webinar on the state of skills driving the innovation workforce. We are very grateful to have Eric and Chad join us this morning to share their insights and address the questions. So uh, today's topic on the state of skills driving the innovation workforce is a timely and pertinent one as the pandemic has redefined the way we work and live. So uh, never before has so much uncertainty fall upon governments, enterprises and people all around the world as well. So as Singaporeans revive uh, the jobs and the economy, it's important to understand the impact of the crisis on the skills landscape and how we could prioritize skills development as the foundation of economic revival. So to all our uh, webinar attendees, I hope you have had good takeaways from this session. We would also like to encourage you to join us in our subsequent webinars, as uh, we, will be, we will be sharing on different topics every month. We, uh, we appreciate it greatly if you could also share with us your thoughts on topics that uh, you would like for us to talk about. Before we close, I would like to invite you to take a two-minute survey. Your feedback, which will be kept confidential, is very important to us and will help us improve our future webinars to serve you better. If you are interested to find out about the initiatives that SkillsFuture has, please refer to the link uh, to the inter Enterprise Portal for Jobs and Skills on the screen. Today's webinar will be hosted on my uh, SkillsFuture Portal, SSG's LinkedIn page and YouTube channel. The slides will also be sent uh, to you via email in the next few days. Once again, my name is Alicia. Together with uh, Tim and Corinne, we want to thank Eric, Chad and the Coursera team for their support. Meanwhile, uh, stay safe and healthy, everyone. Uh, stay tuned for uh, future updates on our May webinar. Thank you. <laughs>